So you're a small business owner. You've been crushed by Democrat governors' heartless lockdowns that had no scientific basis. You've been crushed by their taxes and regulations. Now you've got Biden threatening more taxes and more regulations on top of that. Biden's stay-at-home payments mean you can't get workers. But it's OK, because some Wall Street lady who has a show over on MSNBC has figured out the answer to all this. It is your fault. Here's what Stephanie Rule said. If you can't find workers, your business model doesn't work. What is she talking about? Oh, for my career, I've started a restaurant as well as a venture-backed tech firm and a consulting business. So I know something about different business models. And the idea that a bar owner can't match the government's welfare payments because of its business model is, well, let's ask someone who really knows what these small businesses are going through and who is one of the few people actually helping them. Barstool Sports founder Dave Portnoy. Great to see you. I just was so, this is about a week ago this woman said this, and it just, I'm still enraged by it. Just so insulting to all the people you've helped, telling them their business model's wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that is a problem with a lot, of, a lot of people in politics that they've never worked in the real world. They're lifetime politicians. They don't know what it's like to start a business with your entire life on hold and basically live a business 24-7. Um, but it's a disconnect. It's been a, it, listen, if politicians understood what it took to keep bars and restaurants open, they would have given them money long before the pandemic, you know, put, I mean, I'm in New York right now, feel like sent out of business. So it unfortunately doesn't surprise me. And so wh what do you think now with that, with that sort of attitude that, you know, we can just keep paying? This, you, the people, you're working with these business owners all the time. You've done so much to help them. Are you hearing from them this point that we hear generally that they just can't, it's str they're struggling to get back because now when things are opening up, they can't find the workers because of the payments that, that are being made by the government? You know, I, I haven't. I, I've read more about it than I've heard about it firsthand. I have. I actually haven't heard a ton of people or business owners. Not that I'm talking to them every day, saying they can't find employment because everybody's on, you know, unemployment. No, I haven't heard a ton of that. I've seen the news, but I don't have firsthand experience with that. No. And so, what do you think now? I mean, the, where has it got to your fund? Like, what's the, um, what are some of the numbers? And what do you, what do you, what do you think about the need that's still out there? Well, I mean, listen, like Biden and the administration, which is right steps and restaurant funds in a lot of states that have come about, but it's far too late. I mean, you can't help a restaurant who's already out of business and close the doors. So the book has sort of been written on a lot of the COVID stuff. If you're lucky enough still be in business, they need help because you can't just press go and act like, you know, suddenly you can save what was a year of telling people to close their doors. Um, but, you know, I, I'm in New York, again, cities will come back as long as they're allowed to have customers, have people, because for most parts, most cities are resilient in the United States. Exactly. And that's the lifeblood. I mean, the, the, you know, the, 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 like where you are, the street, you know, the, the life of people, they want to go out, see other people. What do you think this mask, this new, what we, we were just about the mask um, guidance they just changed, you know, you can, if you've been vaccinated, you have to wear a mask. Again, one of the stories you hear is, oh, this is really confusing for businesses because they're going to need to check whether people have been vaccinated or not. What do you make of all of that? I mean, at this point, I think grown adults should be allowed to decide whether they want to go to a bar with or without a mask, with or without vaccination. Um, I felt that way for a long time in the vaccination. A lot of people are getting it. It's time to get back and let business owners, you know, I, again, wh why why do cities open in two weeks? Like, it, it, and I'm in New York, I think May 31st, there's rumors, different states, July 15th. Why? Those are arbitrary dates. What's the difference? These business owners, a lot of them are still hanging on. Let them open now. It's obscene and really no reason. No one can explain what the difference between opening in a week versus today is. It, it makes no sense to me, but I would just say, open the country. If you're scared of COVID, vaccine, mask, do what you want to do. But it's up to individuals to make decisions for themselves. So, so agree with that. We've been saying that all along, Dave. Um, what about your fund? How can people support your fund? So you go to barstoolfund.com. Um, you can donate there. We've raised about $40 million so far for local businesses all throughout the United States. And hopefully, with the weather getting nicer and cold weather cities and things of that nature, we can start getting back to some degree of normalcy. And really, at this point, 
There is no reason in my mind why we can't go back to pre-COVID times and let people make decisions, full ballparks, full stadiums, full bars, full restaurants. It's about time. Exactly right. Totally agree. So great to see you. And it looks like you're out having fun. So that's allowed. That's amazing. Listen, that's progress. We, we've, been, we've been stuck inside. My girlfriend said we got to go to dinner. I said I got to do an interview. I said I'm going to step out. Just be aware. So, yes, uh, I'm finally <laughs> outside. And there's people, there's people outside in New York. So it's nice to see. Fantastic. All right. Great to see you, Dave. Thank you so much. Cheers. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else. House Republicans voted this week to remove Liz Cheney as conference chair for her refusal to stop attacking former President Trump. But she says it won't stop her from running for re-election or from fighting for the future of the GOP. And joining us now from Cheyenne, Wyoming, Congresswoman Cheney. Congresswoman, I want to start with the decision by uh, the House Republican Caucus to remove you this week. Uh, we had Congressman Jim Banks, the head of the Republican Study Committee, on the show last Sunday. And here's what he said about this. Take a look. We shouldn't be talking about Liz Cheney. We should be talking about pushing back against the radical Biden agenda. And th this is all a distraction from our ability to be able to do that. Banks was saying, with Republicans so close to winning back the House in the midterms next year, that the focus should be on what unites the Republican Party, which is opposition to the Biden agenda, and not picking fights with a, a former president who's now living in Mar-a-Lago near Palm Beach. What's wrong with that thinking? Well, I think it is absolutely the case that uh, we have to have the strongest position possible going forward so we can take back the House, the Senate, and the White House. Uh, the, the issue is that, you know, we cannot do that if we are embracing the big lie, if we are embracing what, what President Trump, what former President Trump, continues to say on a nearly daily basis, which is claims that the election was stolen, using the same language he used that he knows provoked violence on January 6th. In order for us to be in the strongest possible position to be able to prevail, to be able to defeat the ideas that we see coming from the other side that are really bad for the country, uh, we have to be a party that's based on a foundation of truth. And uh, I'm, I'm not willing to be uh, complicit uh, or silent in the face of those lies coming from uh, President Trump. But I guess the, the argument is just as a practical politician, and you are a practical politician, what about the, the millions, tens of millions of Republican voters who still support Donald Trump? Uh, why alienate them? I guess the question is, you know, just ignore them. Just don't take the bait and focus on your issues. He's, he's a, living in Mar-a-Lago. Well, you know, I wish we could do that, Chris, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I, as I've said over the course of the last several weeks, uh, former President Trump continues to be a real danger. Uh, what he's doing and what he's saying, his claims, his, his refusal, refusal to accept decisions uh, by the courts, uh, his claims continued as recently as yesterday that somehow this election was stolen. You know, what he's doing is he's, he's causing people uh, to believe that they can't count on our electoral process to uh, actually convey the will of the people. You know, we have to be a nation of laws. Uh, if, if you continue to reject, if you reject the rulings of the courts, if you work against the rulings of our courts, then you really are at war with the Constitution. And, and he is a continuing uh, danger to our system. M those millions of people that you mentioned uh, who supported the president have been misled. They've been betrayed. And uh, certainly, as we see his continued action to attack our democracy, his continued uh, refusal to accept the results of the last election, you see that ongoing danger. Congresswoman Elise Stefanik was elected on Friday to replace you as the number three Republican in the House leadership. And she wasted uh, very little time in saying what she thinks about all this. Take a look. I support President Trump. Uh, voters support President Trump. He is an important voice in our Republican Party, and we look forward to working with him. What do you think of Stefanik? 
Well, I, I think she's wrong. Um, you know, when you have a, a former president who uh, did what Donald Trump did, who provoked an attack on our Capitol to try to stop the counting of electoral votes, to try to steal the election, a former president who continues to threaten the democracy let, in the way that he is, uh, he is he's let, forfeiting let me just interrupt, his, his I, I, opportunity you, to... Well, I just want to ask you, I'm, I'm, I understand what you say about Trump. I'm asking you about Stefanik, who is embracing, wrapping herself in the mantle of Donald Trump. You said to, to, to play along with a big lie is to betray Republican voters. Is she betraying Republican voters? You know, what I said uh, in my last remarks to the conference as chairwoman of the conference was that if they were looking for leaders who would be complicit in, in spreading the big lie, I wasn't their person, that there were plenty of other people who would do that. Uh, I, I think that that's a, it is fundamentally dangerous, uh, and I think it's wrong, and I think as Republicans especially, we have a responsibility to, to stand up and to say we believe in the Constitution, we will fight for that, we will fight for the rule of law, and to build that foundation so that we can get back the voters we lost uh, in 2020. I mean, that is really a key here. Uh, we lost the House, the Senate, and the White House while Donald Trump was president. We've got to get voters back so that we can get Republicans back into position where our policies are the ones uh, that are, are, you know, in place uh, that, frankly, are the ones that are necessary for the future of the nation. During uh, your round of interviews this week, you were also asked about House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy, and here's what you had to say about him. I think that he is not leading with principle right now. Uh, and I think that it is, it's sad and I think it's dangerous. When you talk about him being dangerous uh, and, and the way he's, he's leading the party, and I ask this about both McCarthy and, uh, and, and Elise Stefanik, are they being complicit in what you consider the Trump lies? They are, and, and I'm, I'm not willing to do that. You know, I think that, that there are uh, some things that have to be bigger than party, that have to be bigger than partisanship. Our oath to the Constitution is one of those. Uh, I've seen countries, I've worked in countries around the world where you don't have a peaceful transition of power. What's happening right now with uh, uh, Donald Trump and, and his continued attacks on the Constitution and the rule of law is dangerous, and, and we all have an obligation to stand up against that. You also say that uh, Kevin McCarthy should testify, but what it appears is going to be a new commission to investigate the riot on January 6th and should testify specifically about the conversation he had with the president on that day where he reportedly called the president and said, you got to call this off. And the president said, Kevin, it appears some people are more interested in this election than you are. I asked uh, Congressman McCarthy about that a couple of weeks ago. Take a look at that exchange. Has the president ever reached out to you since that report came out to discuss what you and he talked about in the January 6th phone call? And did you say to him, I can't because we're under oath? No. That never happened? It's never happened. And you would have never even close. And, and if it did happen, you would agree that would be witness tampering? Yeah, but never happened. Congresswoman, do you know anything about that, whether or not uh, Kevin McCarthy and Donald Trump talked and the president tried to reach out to, in effect, get their story straight about what happened in that January 6th phone call? Uh, Leader McCarthy has uh, spoken to a number of people uh, in, in large groups and small groups since the 6th about his exchanges with the president. Uh, he's spoken publicly on the House floor about his view of the president's responsibility. Uh, I think it's very important that, uh, you know, he clearly has facts about that day, uh, that uh, an investigation into what happened, into the president's actions, uh, ought to get to the bottom of. And I think that he has uh, important information uh, that needs to be part of any investigation, whether it's the FBI, the Department of Justice, uh, or this commission that I, I hope will be set up. What, what do you think that accomplishes? Uh, if if he testifies before the commission, I mean, I, I, I understand your concern about uh, President Trump and what you say are his lies about the election, but what do you think it accomplishes to talk about a conversation on January 6th? Do you think that raises issues of his, President Trump's responsibility for the riot, whether or not he's trying to tamper with Kevin McCarthy as a witness? 
Certainly. I mean, I think that, that you know, any conversations, and we, we know certainly that that conversation happened, uh, any conversations that have gone on uh, with the president about the president's potential involvement in uh, January 6th, his potential determination not to step in and offer assistance, uh, any any conversations uh, that have to have to do with you know any members of Congress, uh, those you know people who may be retired. We know that there were conversations in the Oval Office before this about the possibility of declaring martial law and seizing uh, you know election and seizing the ballot machines. Um, so I think that that all of this really points to why it's so important that we have a commission. You know we've done that after Pearl Harbor. We did it after the Kennedy assassination. We did it after 9/11. It's the way that we as a country come together in a nonpartisan fashion to understand what happened, to get to the bottom of it. It must have subpoena power uh, and, and to begin to take steps so we can ensure it never happens again. I got uh, about a minute left, Congresswoman. Uh, I want to talk about you finally. You were on track to perhaps someday be the Speaker of the House. Now that's over. You've been removed from leadership. Uh, your reelection next year in Wyoming is at least in question. I guess the question I have for you is, are you prepared to make this politically the hill you're prepared to die on? Look, I, I cannot imagine a more important issue than whether or not the Republican Party is going to be a party that embraces and defends the rule of law and the Constitution. Uh, and I am firmly committed to uh, being part of leading this party back to a place where we believe and, and advocate on, the, on behalf of policies and substance, where we lay out an agenda that helps to attract voters back to the party, uh, where we move away from uh, this loyalty that so many, uh, particularly in our House leadership now, uh, have apparently pledged to uh, Donald Trump. Uh, the president who provoked the right. attack on the Capitol and who refused to send help. So I, I think that, that what we have seen over the course of the last couple of weeks is really you know, the opening salvo in, in what is a battle for the soul of the Republican Party, a battle for the soul of our democracy. And I intend to, to play a very big role in that, to do everything I can uh, to help ensure that we can restore our party. Congresswoman, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Always good to talk with you. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell to so get notifications anytime I go live.